Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Zoning Review Committee meeting of March 12th, 2024. This meeting is being conducted remotely online through the Zoom meeting app, and public participation is encouraged through the app or by phone. This is in accordance with the extension of COVID pandemic provisions, allowing remote public meetings by the general court through March 31st, 2025 per chapter two of the acts of 2023. So first up on the agenda is a quick review of the MBTA community's feedback from the Attorney General's office. And um, with that, I will send this over to Eric and you can give us a quick update. Great, thanks very much. Uh, let me just pull up uh, what we're working on here. I can share my screen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, does everybody have an opportunity to see the Word document that's up on the screen? Yes. Right, that's a couple of nods. Um, yeah. This is what was filed with the, essentially, it wasn't filed with the clerk's office. It was filed um, with the planning office. This is what was uploaded to the website for public viewing um, based on our original advertisement for the hearing to start on March 21st. However, last Thursday, I learned that the planning board is not going to have a quorum um, on the 21st, so we're going to be re-advertising to start our hearings for zoning amendments on April 4th. Um, so that's why this was revised on March 7th. That's the date that it got posted. Um, everything in this document is essentially the same as what the Zoning Review Committee had seen last time. So I'm just going to be scrolling down to the section where we received some feedback um, from the Attorney General's office. Um, we also have this language submitted to the EOHLC, which I have not received feedback from. Um, I would anticipate it almost any single day now. Uh, Margaret Hurley works for the Attorney General's office and um, their comments with regards to the 12 and a half percent inclusionary zoning uh, note and or requirement that's within the language for the MBTA communities bylaw basically was advising us that, well, what happens if there is a situation that you didn't predict and um, the EOHLC determines that the 12.5% uh, inclusionary requirement is not feasible? That's unlikely since we did have a um, <clears throat> an economic feasibility analysis created and submitted to the EOHLC that was strongly supportive that uh, projects or development projects uh, that include 12.5% inclusionary zoning have plenty of profit margin for developers um, to move forward with development. But you never know what's going to happen. So she was suggesting some language get inserted to cover that case to ensure that at a very minimum, uh, the town has 10%. So that's what I did. <clears throat> I made an edit that says that um, if the EOHLC determines in writing that the town hasn't shown uh, that this 12.5% requirement to be feasible, at least 10% of the dwelling units in any development containing 10 or more units shall be, in, sorry, will be inclusionary dwelling units with household income limited to 80% of the area median income and eligible for inclusion on the subsidized housing inventory. And this comment um, is in line with and matches um, feedback that the planner in Tewksbury had received, um, who used some similar language. Does anybody have questions about the slight edit that was made there? Yes, Eric, on the uh, Margaret's uh, notice, uh, <clears throat> her comment said containing eight or more dwellings, at least 15%. And then uh, below that would be uh, 10%. Um, we have, uh, so you, were, you, you went down to follow her lead on the at least 10% of 10 or more. Why wouldn't Correct. that be eight or more? Um, well, most it's up to the board how you'd like to do the calculations, but one of the reasons why we settled on 12.5% is that it works exceptionally well with um, uh, units developed in uh, units of eight. So it's one out of the eight units um, when it's 12.5%. If you've got a 10%, it's one out of every 10. Um, you could round up where if it's eight or more, we can easily make that change. Okay, thank you. Eric, was it? Feedback about the 12 and a half percent. 
No, uh, the Attorney General's office didn't uh, want to overstep their bounds. Um, they're letting the EOHLC evaluate the uh, economic feasib feasibility analysis that we submitted, since they're the ones that are requiring it. And it's their guidelines that stipulated that 10% was the maximum inclusionary zoning without special analysis. And it says that Lexington's got 15%. Is that what is that been approved or is that just what they're asking for? Or am I not reading that right? Um, she was just give she just basically cut and pasted language um, from Lexington. That that language has been accepted by EOHLC. Um, I think that Lexington probably submitted some sort of feasibility analysis for 15%. And my guess is that they might have, they probably received it. So I'm, again, I'm still optimistic and I'd, I would be fighting pretty hard uh, if there was a rejection of the 12.5% from Tingsboro because it seems extremely reasonable and it works very well for developers. And it, help me understand the 10% then. Well, I mean, if we're going to say 12.5%, why don't we just say that and leave the 10% out? The Attorney General's office advice was trying to assist the town and protect the town's interests. If you want to have inclusionary zoning requirements in your MBTA community's bylaw, they're trying to help you cover all your bases in the event because EOHLC reserved its own discretion to determine whether or not a community justified anything over 10%. If they change their mind or if there's something that takes place in the future, we don't want there to be any confusion about what happens if the EOHLC rejects the 12.5% that Tingsboro wrote into its bylaw. So this is a fallback in the unlikely event that there's a rejection of 12.5%. So we know that we have, we, we're still going to max it out. And the developer has to prove that it's not, that the 12.5% is not achievable. Is that right? Uh, it's no, <clears throat> it's not the developer. Um, Twelve and a half percent is what the community in Tingsboro uh, requested to be included for an inclusionary requirement in its MBTA community's bylaw. As a planner, I think it makes a lot of sense. And the zoning review committee um, obviously identified that 12 and a half percent of eight units is one nice even um, unit, which makes perfect sense. But the EOHLC, who is the entity that is the entity that uh, has the discretion to evaluate and is required to accept each community bylaw after it's been... Sorry, Jeremy, can you mute your mic for a sec? Sorry. E EOHLC has, um, is required to approve each individual town's bylaw even before it gets to the attorney general's office um, when, after it passes town meeting. Since they have discretion to determine, you know, what works and what doesn't, and they've already limited inclusionary zoning to 10%, they've requested that any community that re includes more than 10% inclusionary requirements in their zoning bylaw language to go through a process to prove that uh, development in that community with their requested inclusionary percentage is not cost prohibitive to development. So they're trying to have... They're trying to prevent communities from using inclusionary zoning from prevent to prevent development. That's not what Kingsborough's objective is here. It's simply to have an, a reasonable number to protect the SHI, to produce affordable housing in a number that's friendly to developers. Um, the economic feasibility analysis that uh, we worked on with an independent uh, consultant to provide to EOHLC provided very strong numbers that identified that projects with 12.5% inclusion were plenty profitable and strong enough uh, to justify development. That's why I'm quite confident that we won't have to worry about it. The Attorney General's office simply says, well, you never know. We've seen weirder things happen um, you know, in the, in the world of zoning and legalese. What are you going to do if they decide to reject or come up with a reason or argue against your 12.5% unforeseen? You don't have any language in there that handles that situation. We recommend putting in this language that gets you, that specifies that you at the very minimum want the maximum inclusionary zoning that EOHLC is currently allowing, which is 10%. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah, um, I, I like the the even numbers. I didn't, I never really thought of that in that way, but I think it makes a lot of sense when things are broken down between um, 
eight and, and 10 units essentially uh, in this fashion. So I, I think that I never thought about it when we, I remember doing the, the seven units and not really thinking about the math problem, but when you divide it out, it makes a lot of sense. So I, um, I like that part. Thanks. And is there is there a provision that we have to round up, or they just, or they, could they just say, well, it's ten percent, but you don't have ten units? Um, they they were actually advising communities not to use the round up language. We decided to put it in there to see what their feedback was going to be. I'm hoping that they'll leave it in. And we have that in there. Then I'm trying to read this here. Correct. Uh, that's the first line that's listed there. So fractional okay. units are rounded up to the next whole number. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Does is anybody else on the zoning review committee want to continue to discuss whether or not that contingency language shouldn't be ten percent of ten; it should be ten percent of eight? No, it makes sense to me. Um, and that's what we had talked about. And Lisa covers us if they do decide to uh, make an unwise decision to reject our 12 and a half. Okay. All set, Mr. Chair, would you like me to go on yep. to the next okay. comment? Yep, okay. please go on, yep. Okay, um, so the next comment um, had to do with including language in the, um, in the MBTA community's bylaw itself that has to do with site plan review. Um, so as you might recall, there was a long section that had to do with some things that needed to be included with a submittal um, for a project in the MBTA community's district. But I don't think at any point in time did the zoning review committee, the public, or even myself anticipate not utilizing the existing site plan review language that the town has in its own bylaw. So when I read Margaret Hurley's comments, um, I reached out to a couple of other communities, Tuxbury included. They ran into a, almost exactly the same problem. And um, I incorporated language that was similar to theirs that simply says, we don't want to be following a separate site plan review process. We want to be following the site plan review process that's already been defined in the section 2.8. However, I'm trying to learn from the comments that we've received or that other communities that have already received from EOHLC where they've flagged any components in a site plan review process that's already defined that refers to anything associated with a denial of a site plan review. Kingsborough's site plan review process does have a section 2.8.6.b that reads denial of, a, denial of the site plan based on a determination that either there's insufficient information that was submitted with the application um, determination that the project does not meet the requirements of this section in general, uh, or that no reasonable conditions can accomplish the goal of having the application meet those requirements. In the anticipation that the EOHLC is going to request that that section get omitted from the site plan review requirements for projects proposed under this section of the bylaw, I've included that language in here to try to keep it clean so that we can have acceptable language proposed at town meeting on May 7th. So the edit reads as follows. Under submission requirements, which was already included in the original draft of the MBTA Communities Bylaw, we now say that an applicant must follow the submission requirements and procedures defined in section 2.8, except section 2.8.6b, which I just read, having to do with the denial of a site plan review, uh, for the by right multifamily use defined in this section. Final action on site plans shall be limited to approvals or approval with the imposition of reasonable conditions. And that's the language essentially that the EOHLC is looking for from communities uh, in their site plan review process. And I'm happy to take some questions about how that affects Kingsboro, if at all. I'm going to scroll down on the screen just so we can see some of the language that was stricken because I feel confident that the site plan review process that the town already has essentially covers everything in there with maybe the exception of conceptual floor plans. But those are things that the, the planning board can request. Um, and I think that's a reasonable, either a condition or a reasonable request for an application that they receive um, under this district. 
But plans, so plans aren't required at this time, or is that not, uh, not that's not under site plan review at this time? I don't think we specifically call out, um, not in our zoning bylaw anyway, but our checklist for site plan review does include architectural plans. So I would expect them to be included. And if the planning board staff receives it and we go through it, we can identify that we'd be looking for some of that. Um, sometimes when site plan review, site plans are submitted for review, even for, um, you know, in front of the planning board, they might not have gotten to the point of defining floor plans uh, yet. So sometimes it might be a discussion with the planning board that those are materials that get developed during the application and review process based on feedback from the planning board itself. I see a problem with five and nine. Okay. Being, being totally waived like that. So, for instance, anything with uh, adjacent a property abutters having an, an issue. So, <clears throat> waiving our rights with site plans that show position, access, vehicular circulation, and egress, stormwater management, uh, screening of adjacent properties, and then going down to uh, we're not going to require a site plan from a registered in Massachusetts, Commonwealth the Massachusetts architect or civil engineer. That's yeah, I can pause you. If I could pause you right there, Joe, just I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to point out that we're not waiving any of that. All of those <laughs> items are included in our site plan review requirements. So we're not waiving, you know, the the view of the position of um, buildings on the site plan. Of course, that absolutely needs to be required. It even mentions in the sentence that was stricken is that it's typically commonly required of site plan review. And then all of the items on number nine with regards to having certified architects, um, landscape architects, civil engineers, those are all requirements. So when our site plans are received for review um, before they get to the planning board, we check to see if they've been stamped. So statement number three, <laughs> that that's the caveat, says final action on all site plans shall be limited to two things, an approval, or an approval with imposition of reasonable conditions. Correct. How does that affect five, six, seven, eight, and nine? So for instance, someone now doesn't have an abutters plan or vehicular traffic, they haven't done a study. So we're gonna, they're gonna come back and, and we're gonna nickel and dime. We're gonna say, well, you didn't do the study. We need the study. Um, we don't have an abutment plan for, for abutters for lighting. And, and so you're gonna have to come back and do that study. Uh, no, those are requirements with our site. You want to verify. Statement could. number three says you're you're going by right by it says for the by right multifamily final action on site plans should be limited to an approval mm -hmm. as submitted or an approval with the imposition of reasonable conditions. You right. are not so, defining what those reasonable conditions are. If you don't define those reasonable conditions, they could be anything. And that's true. And that's actually one of the authorities um, that are given to the site plan review um, entity. So that body is the planning board. Um, we don't want to limit the number of things that the planning board has to um, <clears throat> adhere to with regards to conditions. So this gives the planning board the ability to impose reasonable conditions on things that we might not have anticipated. No, it doesn't. Regret. So so you, you're you going to have to either stricken uh, statement number three and reimpose all through four through nine. Otherwise, we're going to waive our rights. Not waiving I don't care how you word it, it, but the way it's worded in section three, it's either an approval or approval with corrections. I'm right. saying that's what by reasonable right conditions. Means. So, so that, no, that 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 can be wide open unless they're delineated. You're screwed. Oh, if I if I can, Eric, could I just jump in for a second? Um, because I, I Joe, I, I guess I want clarity on this too. Because my understanding is requirements and procedures defined as in section two point eight. That part is the site plan. That that's the whole site plan review section. There's four pages here of planning planning board review process, and all this does is strikes the one element that says the the language of denial because. As of right, you we're, we're not, at least in my understanding is we're not uh, in the MBTA zoning, the way that the attorney general wants it written is that it can't be denied, at, but it still goes through the site plan review process. Is, is that so, right? So Eric? it can be denied. So it will be denied. 
if somebody doesn't follow our regular process, it will be denied. But here, I mean, number I, three is in contrast to that. It's saying it so cannot be denied. That is wrong. That is wrong. Could, the state, the state I, is wrong on this. It could open us up to litigation, almost oh, yeah. like a, a denying of a, a 40B project, in my opinion. Like it, this, this, this has got yeah. legal written all over. Yeah, a lawsuit. It, they can't it, be it, denied, but yet we are denying you. We're not. Mr. Paul, the town's not denying anything, right? So we, A, we haven't passed the MBTA community zoning bylaw. Yet, wait a minute, wait so. a minute. You're putting the cart before the horse again, okay? Of course we haven't voted on it. It hasn't gone right. to town meeting. By the way, so, does this does this have to get ratified at at a town vote vote wide meeting, or a, a town vote, or is this uh, strictly at town town meeting? It's a it's a zoning bylaw, so it does need to be approved at town meeting on May seventh. And it but it doesn't need to go before a vote before the general general population. No, no, no. It's a zoning amendment. Okay, so and, that's why and I, I want to be even more specific. Is that you're leaving yourself open for a lot of interpretation here by waving by right that statement to have, three. That, that's totally to have, i'm happy to have you attend the public hearing for the zoning amendment on april 4th where I'll, i'm hoping that either on april 4th or april 18th we'll have town council available to answer some of those questions if you don't believe me that I'm telling you that you're not waiving any rights, you're not leaving yourself vulnerable to anything additional, um, the language, I'd like to point you to review the language in section 2.8, the site plan review portion of the existing zoning bylaw, the recodified portion of it. The zoning review committee spent a lot of time ensuring that the site plan review process for the town is extremely comprehensive. And it's what, it's the process that the committee and I think the public was expecting all of the applications for an MBTA community's proposal to be following. I'm trying to take the attorney general's advice to say we don't want there to be any confusion about what site plan review process an applicant should be following. Some of these items were sort of like generalized. And she says, well, if you're specifying a site plan review process right within your bylaw, that's going to take precedence. That is not what the Zoning Review Committee or the public or the planning staff is advising for the community. We want applicants to be following the site plan review process that's been stipulated in Section 2.8, because as, um, as Jeremy mentioned, it's four pages of requirements and gives a lot of discretion for the conditions that a planning board can impose on the applications. If there are elements in the application that are missing from our checklist, the staff review, you know, reviews those deficiencies with the applicant and then asks for those materials to be submitted before they accept the site plan review application. But it's in process and they will get approval. They can never be, get rejected. They can never get rejected with this wording. That's what that I'm is, saying. and that is exactly what site, that is what by right means. Meaning if you have um, a, a, a residential zoning district, right, where residential homes are, um, permissible by right, correct? So we have single family homes, they're permissible by right in the R1 district, correct? Right, so if we've got residential homes that can be constructed by right in the R1 district, there are still regulations and requirements that um, need to be followed in order for them to get their building permits to, to move forward, or if there's a they larger- They can get project, rejected, they can get rejected. This you right, can't, those this is a total different ball game, but it's a state power play. But anyway, the way it's worded right now, I, I object to that wording in statement number three. I don't care what kind of what you put behind it and what you've eliminated and you're referring back to the regular site plan. But if you look at statement number three, it actually explicitly stays stay, stays that in section 2.86, the denial provision, it basically goes away. Correct, because we want the language that gets proposed to town meeting and hopefully pass that town meeting to be accepted by the EOHLC. Could you just scroll up for one second? I just want to see the, the comments from the Attorney General's office, please. Now, I understand. It says that right the there that requirements of Section 2.8 do not apply to uses in this district. If Instead, you kept it unedited. 
So we needed to specify because it was always the intention of the zoning review committee that applications should be held accountable to the, all the requirements of the site plan review process and section. That's that's what I thought. Right. So that's what I that's the edit that we've made here. It was a good observation from the attorney general's office saying you're creating a gray area here that I don't think you were intending to. So my suggestion is if you want them to be um, up adhering to section 2.8 to say so. However, I think you got to go. I think you have to go back back to uh, Margaret Hurley here and get explanation. You got to you got to explain to them. Explain to them what? Uh, explain that what they require is a basically an elimination of our rights to reject a development that does not meet the standards put forth by the town zoning bylaws. Uh, can I can I get some clarity on like well uh, site plan review because we re reviewed a, a lot of stuff um, over the last couple of years here and you know we we ha we talked about site plan review requirements and special permit requirements we we did something different there. And obviously, special permit requirements uh, have a different denial process than an as of right. So I don't know, Eric, is, does that have any play here of why this requirement is happening? Like, or that language can't be included? I'm just trying to understand myself and educate the public about why that language has to be there. So at the very least, the language needs to be inside our MBTA community's bylaw referring to Section 2.8 to be absolutely clear for people who are submitting applications for that district, they know what site plan review requirements they have to adhere to. If we have separate site plan review requirements in the MBTA community's um, bylaw, it creates confusion about which site plan review process and requirements they need to adhere to. Can I also get a clarification? Let me get let me ask for some clarification because I, I think I understand where, where Joe is coming from. It is a is a buy right type of um, situation. They apply, we do the site plan review, and we don't, it doesn't meet our site plan review process. If I'm hearing you correctly. That doesn't mean that it's been rejected. It just means that they have to keep going until they meet the requirements of that site plan review. Is that is that correct? I would say correct? that's correct because you could say that it's our site plan review process in section 2.8 makes it very clear what the town's expectations are. So if you're having difficulty getting an applicant to comply with components there, that would be considered a reasonable, either a reasonable condition or a reasonable request of the applicant. So you, the planning board could either refuse to take action or continue its hearing or not approve the site plan until they receive that information. And if it takes it to litigation or something, I would feel confident that the town would, would win. We want to create zoning bylaws that are clear enough to try to avoid that situation. Um, but there's you can't control what level of... Um, I guess, lack of adherence an applicant might have. Um, so if they decide not to comply with anything in the zoning bylaw, Joe, that does not mean that they are receiving an automatic approval. That's not what that means. No, that's not what it says. <clears throat> it says that they have an approval with stipulations. How they meet right. those stipulations, 50%, 80%, 90%, that's open for interpretation. It's not clearly delineated. And the fact that you... You know, scratch number four, for instance, application and fee for site plan review. So regular developers. Because that's already in that process. Okay. I, I wanna, Joe, I want to explain that just because it's language that's been stricken from this portion, this draft of the bylaw doesn't mean that it's not being imposed whatsoever on the applicant. It means that it's been covered somewhere else so that we can be clear. So, well, that, that has to be written down. That has the and it, your it does it refers to specifically reference, to section two point eight. You have to you have to reference back to our a regular site plan review with criteria. We did. That's what section two point eight is. It's, uh, go back to section two point eight.
clear screens have switched to sharing the Tingsboro zoning bylaw itself and I'm displaying the first portion of uh, section 2.8, the site plan review. And which section are you referring to within site plan review? The purpose or the applicability? Well, we're, we're, well okay. the whole thing, the only one is <coughs> I'm referring to point. all of it because applicants need to Well, wait a minute, go back. I just, saw the, I just saw denial. Right. So section... Further on up. 6B. Right. This is the only portion that would not apply. Of the entire section 2.8, this is the only section that would not apply um, to MBTA communities applications. And I was suggesting that it be, I guess, it, um, exempted from the language that's in the MBTA community's bylaw based on the feedback that another community already received on their bylaw that had the same issue. Well, I, I would change that denial and probably say moratorium. So even though you have insufficient information was submitted, that's a cause. You're, you're telling me that's a cause, right? Determination that the project does not meet the requirements of Section 2.8. That's a cause, and no reasonable conditions can accomplish the goal. So it should be a motor moratorium at some point. And what is your fallback position if the project should not proceed? We there is no out for the town. There's no way that they can go back and find something that's detrimental, and and say that this this proposal does not meet the criteria of the site plan review. You're waiving all your rights. Just want you to be clear of that. I want you to state that to everybody on this on this committee and let the town know that. The site plan review process itself works the same way, regardless of it's an MBTA community's uh, application for that district or an application for another use in the table of uses that's listed as a site plan review. Site plan reviews uh, uses are not by special permit. And one of the things that distinguishes um, site plan review uses from special permit uses is that an application or a use that's a site plan review is not a, uh, a discretionary, ap discretionary application that can be denied. You can impose reasonable conditions on it. You can evaluate the application based on your site plan review process that you've already defined. And if you choose to not approve um, a site plan review based on some sort of deficiency, the idea is to either impose the conditions that solve the issue and they should be reasonable. Um, and it's possible that an applicant says, well, yeah, you've, you've imposed these conditions. Uh, we don't think they're reasonable. The planning board says, well, we do think they're reasonable. It's listed right here in our site plan review process or, you know, reason X, Y, Z. And then it's, it's up to the courts to determine, you know, whether the planning board's conditions were reasonable or not. But that's the procedure, that's the process that the state has put together for non-special permit uses for site plan review. Of course, that's how the state's going to behave in this case, yes. Of course. It, it's not. Eric, can you pull up the, the language that we were looking at, bef not in our current bylaws, but in, in the the language that we were originally re reviewing because my understanding where the sentence after it refers to section 2.8 did it come yeah. back up okay. yeah so if i look at this right um and it's items three the the number three looks like it's struck out is that that shouldn't be struck out right right it would be one two and yeah, one, two, and three. Right. So three three should be there. We, we need to change that red line. But the way I'm wondering if we look at it and say the, the last sentence where it says for the buy right multifamily use in this section, final action on site plans shall be limited to approval or approval with imposition of reasonable conditions or as Joe was talking about, a moratorium or something else that denotes, you know, it's, it's not approved. It's not approval with reasonable conditions. It has never, it has not completed the process. It's still going through that process. 
Okay, so can I ask why the sentence that precludes it uh, or precedes it isn't adequate? So with, here we say that the for projects, let's see, uh, the applicant must follow the submission requirements and procedures defined in section 2.8. Yep. Right, so if they're not following those portions, they're already non-compliant with the bylaw. And I can see where Joe's saying is that the two sentences might be in conflict with each other. And to make them clearer, you could either have the, um, the last sentence go before that one to say, you know, for the, the um, by right multifamily using section final action would be limited to approve approval uh, with imposition of reasonable conditions. Such approvals must follow the submission of and requirements and procedures defined in section 2.8, except for sections 2.86B. Do you know what I'm saying? So that- I'm having a hard saying, time seeing the difference between what we have. Well, yeah. I, I'm so I understand where Joe's coming from. And Joe, correct me if I'm not uh, interpreting what you're saying correctly, but the way I look at it is I, I could see where there's a little bit of a gray area because you have the, the second sentence which says, Look at the site plan review. That's what we're following because we don't want to have separate language in there. That way, if site plan review changes, we don't have to change it in two places. We're, we're going to have it in one place. Got it. Yeah. However, we, we say that we're going to follow that, but then it says um, it's either going to be a site plan that's approved or approval with the imposition of reasonable conditions. It doesn't say, you know what? It could be that um, they don't want to meet the requirements ever and it just sits there in, in a moratorium. And it, it, I, I, I can understand that part of the equation. And it could be that if you flip the, um, the, the sentences, have the last one that's there, go at, in front of it and add in that it could be, you know, while I don't, and I don't know what the, the official term is, but while it's pending or it's in a moratorium or whatever, have it go first and then say, you know, such um, approvals will follow the um, the site plan review process requirements and procedures as defined in section 2.8 of the zoning uh, of this sec of this bylaw. Joe, is that is that kind of That's what you're in essence? About? In essence, what I was trying to say, yes. Okay. And and I was trying to impose the 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 solution probably uh, not as worded as as well as you. However, I wanted to give everyone an idea as to what the possibilities were if we run into that situation. Let's figure that out now before we get into that situation. Right. Does the language that I typed in that's hopefully highlighted in gray on your screen help? I think that would be fine. From my perspective, I, I think it it's it's pretty clear the order of those. I mean, I I would love to have council give us a review on that to, just to make sure because this is a this is something that could um, have big impact if there's any gray area and and I think that the language should be really tight. Thank you. So while I absolutely agree, town council will be is reviewing all of our um, language. Is there anything else in if that I'm I think this is fine to try to include that gray um, highlighted sentence. Um, it's something I'd probably discuss or review with the EOHLC to make sure that they're OK with it. Um, we've probably been waiting for EOHLC's final um, feedback from us before we have a more detailed conversation with town council. Again, this language has to get through to, you know, we have two public meetings available April 4th and 18th um, to have discussions and raise issues and try to get them, you know, if there's any other additional changes or languages or concerns like uh, Joe just brought up, that we can be reviewing those types of changes with EOHLC. So the language that does get proposed to town meeting on May 7th is sort of pre-approved by EOHLC. We want to make sure that we don't have town meeting vote on something, whether they pass or reject it. We want to make sure that it's something that we can say, EOHLC already told us that if town meeting passes this, it'll be accepted. 
So by all means, I mean, we don't submit any zoning articles or, or language that haven't been reviewed by town council. Bob's got his hand raised. <laughs> He's been very patient. Um, <laughs> Fascinating discussion. But while that discussion was going on, I just pulled up um, the MBTA community's um, site plan review section because I didn't really know the answer to some of the questions that you were asking, Joe. I hadn't heard people raise that before. And the section on uh, site plan review, um, well, it indicates it's optional. You could skip the site plan review and just go to totally by right, which is just issuing a building permit. But towns have the right to do site plan review. And it says, um, so this is a question I would say for Eric to ask both maybe the, both the Attorney General and um, Housing and Livable Communities. It says site plan review is limited to the regulation of the use and a site plan review authority may impose reasonable conditions when considering the site plan approval. Now here's the important sentence, more the uh, applicable sentence. Site plan review may not be denied except for the limited reasons to the extent permitted by applicable Massachusetts law. Now, the three reasons Eric initially gave that's in your site plan review process, that's in most towns site plan review process, because the courts have repeatedly said, it's a by right review process and you really try to condition it, but if, if they don't submit plans that you can review, if they submit plans that don't meet the requirements of your site plan review process, or if they cannot meet a specific standard, such as you know they need 50 parking spaces and they only have 10, those are grounds for denial. So my question is, if the language in the the, the um, MBTA community's advisory guidebook here says you can deny, you can't deny, you use it for conditions except for reasons granted by Massachusetts law. Those three reasons are established by Massachusetts courts. So the question is, does DCLI, uh, what is it, uh, housing and commun livable communities, recognize those three reasons or does the attorney general recognize those three reasons or is there something else somewhere in the MBA communities that somehow overrides those three reasons? And it also says per current Massachusetts state law, which can be changed and modified at any time also. Well, the, you're right, but the, since the courts, all the way up to and including the Supreme Judicial Court, have established and repeated those three reasons, there's never been any suggestion of trying to override the courts. And I would, I would, I just would never expect something like that. Aren't those our three? If I look at Section two point eight point six B, the the denial piece of that, that sounds like what you just described, Bob. Yes, exactly. So, so why wouldn't why can't we just say accept take out that except section two point eight point six B? Well, I, I guess that's my question, and, and it's a question I just said. Right. I think asking the attorney general's office and in and in, in housing and livable communities are they, uh, and I'm just using paraphrasing here, quote unquote, overriding the court decision on why a town could, or a planning board could deny a, a site plan review for the MBTA Communities Act? Or are they forgetting about that? Or, or what's the reasoning behind this? That's all I'm thinking. Somebody and maybe some other towns already asked this question. Eric, it's uh, 2.8.6B, I believe. Not C, that should be six. It's 2.8C6B. Our bylaws? Yes. 
Well, in the red right there, it says, except section 2.8.6B, not C. Thank you. That's what I was saying. Okay. So my question is, going back to Joe's point of like, why doesn't the whole section of 2.8 uh, apply? It doesn't, I, I guess, does is the attorney general or or Bob, maybe this is a question for you, since you know uh, our our how we redid our special permit and site plan review processes. Should we just reword six the two point eight point six point B item so it applies to all site plan review, not just this one? And going back to your point about it has to meet mass general laws, is there something to be edited within that one item that? Can be more universal across all of our site plan review process well i i think the way it's written here it says the applicant must follow the submission requirements and procedures defined in section 2.8 so that covers the existing language in 2.8 which is your site plan review section so you i think you already covered there but then the question becomes the accept clause except 2.8 C 6 B um why is the AG's office saying that except clause has to be put in there can you just bring up that one item Eric that that the language of that one specific spot in the bylaw uh, the 6 B So do we think that the, the issue that may be is the, the use of the term denial, but I mean, it is a denial. You're sitting there saying, you didn't give me all the information or you know what, you're trying to fit a project that there's no possible way it can be done, right? I mean, they, they're trying to put too much stuff in a small area or it, it just, it's not feasible given the site plan review requirements that we that we have that you know we've all agreed to yeah absolutely you can't stuff too much stuff into any one site not have any parking for example or any of the other elements and it just says it has to be those conditions have to be reasonable right you know what whatever we have in the site plan review process they they have to be reasonable conditions okay we're not trying to submit something in there that's unreasonable we're sitting there saying you're, you're trying to fit you know <laughs> it, it what you have is something that's unreasonable and we have to have the ability to to deny something that's patently unreasonable yeah absolutely so it sounds like what we need to do is get clarification i mean all this kind of goes what my understanding is that three could stay the same if we just stopped at requirements and procedures defined in section 2.8, period. That's it. Get rid of the rest of the stuff that's in there because we get rid of the exception for 2.8 C6B. And then the, you know, the other two sentences really aren't needed because that's already covered. Sounds reasonable to me. And it could be, I understand what the AG's office is doing. They're dealing with a lot of bylaws and our bylaws would have been a mess two years ago if we were doing this, but we cleaned up everything and we did just do the site plan review process. So 
we just updated the, the thing. So ours are probably more likely to be in compliance, um, you know, setting reasonable conditions for that following Mass General Law already. Correct. The Attorney General's office has already accepted all the language that's in the town's site plan review process. So it could be, it could be that they're just they're denying those types of things because everybody else is submitting stuff that you know, hasn't been done recently and ours has. But I would feel comfortable with the denial piece. I mean, I would feel comfortable. We just had the, 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 the whole piece in there. It just says, hey, it's got to follow our site plan review process. We're not doing something special for MBTAs. It's, this is how we do it with all of them. Yeah, I agree. I will discuss those with the AG's office as well as EOHLC and town council. Okay. Thank you. And then, Eric, when you when you are talking to the AG's office and um, the EOHLC, we we should note specifically that we we just did our site plan review process, and it just passed. It's not like it's been sitting out there for ten years and have, might have some outdated provisions. It, it is to date. Sure. And the only other items that I had made changes to was to make sure that the site plan review process is administered by the planning board as intended. Um, and that's the applicability of it. The application for site plan review shall be reviewed by the um, planning board, not some generic permitting authority or the zoning enforcement officer, et cetera. We want to clarify that. And those are the only edits. Good. We're getting there. We're getting there. All right. Any other questions about item one on the agenda? Let's move on to number two, which uh, will be updates discussion with uh, Barrett Consulting Group. Uh, revise the sign regulations and modernize mixed use of zoning language. Bob, this is you, buddy. Uh, so this, the uh, mixed use piece of this is something Judy is working on and she couldn't be with us tonight. So I don't have an update on that. Um, the sign section. So I'll get it for you, Bob. Oh, you're going to put it up on the screen? So, um, there are various issues with the sign section, as you probably will all remember, or you already all remember. One is just the organization of it, which has always been on the list to come back to to get it better organized and better formatted so it'd be easier to use, easier to find, easier to understand. Um, the second sign issue that we've heard about is in some of the business districts, some of the sign, there's some concerns about some sign standards being too small, especially for businesses that are further away from the street. Um, and then the third issue is uh, an umbrella sign issue for everybody in the country that uh, based on a uh, Supreme Court decision of a number of years ago now, Reed versus Gilbert, they changed how they interpreted what was constitutional in terms of how towns could regulate signs, which in effect probably made, if not 100%, 98% of all sign bylaws in this country somewhat con unconstitutional. So the first issue on the reorganization um, what I did was, and I just got this uh, because I've been so busy with my other clients, I got this done today because I wanted to at least get this in your hands. It's not in your hands right now, it's just on the screen, but I assume Eric will email it to you. Um, is taking the text, and this is one of the things that has come up repeatedly that, that the consultants have been asked to do, is taking the text where we could in the sign body and put it into a tabular format, okay? So 
what you have before you is um, the section of your sign by law um, 311 uh, for residential signs. And um, taking all the texts, it's various sub uh, uh, texts, and organizing that into a tabular form, as you can see. Now, um, when you do this, and I've done this for other towns and other people, other consultants have done it for other towns. If you think about it, most of the information that's in a sign by law is in some ways similar. What does it cover? The types of signs, the height of signs, the size of signs, whether you need a permit or not whether you need, uh, if there's some special regulations on a particular sign. So many of the tables um, for sign bylaws look somewhat similar because you're really trying to aggregate into a table the same kinds of information. So I just took the residential section of your bylaw and then if we keep moving in this direction, then there would be another table for the business sections and then a third table for the industrial district. So residential district, business district, industrial district. And um, uh, so what's the organization? Okay, what's the sign type? You know, what what is the, uh, the, the maximum number, maximum size, where are they allowed? What, are, what standards do you have? For some signs, you have standards. For some signs, there are no standards. And then what kind of, what's the permit requirements? Those are the major things people need to know about what they can and can't do with signs. And then that's across the top. And then down on the left is the kinds of signs that at the moment in current bylaw language, you allow specifically in the residential district. One of the things I did was um, aggregate the permanent sign language under a permanent sign heading, and then the temporary sign language under a temporary sign heading to split those two out, because right now they're intermixed. So it makes sense to have, okay, these are the signs that are permanent, and then together, and then a, a separate category for uh, temporary signs. So just just looking at the table without reading anything, you see what that those two categories are. And then everything, pretty much everything in here is the language in your current bylaw. And you can see, you know, just not, uh, you know, what's the first sign type? Name of owner or occupant of street number. One sign, two square feet, can be attached or freestanding, no no permit required. And then for each sign, you just read across the row and it tells you the size of the sign, um, how many signs, um, what the conditions are, where they're located, and something about the permit requirement. Sometimes a permit is required, sometimes a sign permit by the building commission is required. Um, there's some odd, not odd ones, but unique ones where it might go to the select board or it might go to the zoning board. Um, then there are sec sections um, that reference other sections that people need to know about. So off-premise directional signs. There's another section in the sign bylaw that talks about off-premise signs in more, ela with a more elaborate language. So just putting in a reference, a cross-reference, so people know you've got to look elsewhere. Okay. The same thing, home occupation as a cross um, And so, so on and so forth. So you have two temporary signs, construction signs, real estate signs. Um, I have two questions. You can see on the open or holiday decorative flags, flags the requirement at the bottom of page one. I have an asterisk there, and I've never heard the term used open flag, so I don't know what that means. I went in your definition section, and you have that term in your definition section, 
but it's not defined. So <laughs> I don't know what an open flag is. And I hope somebody there knows because it's a very uncommon term. Uh, and you don't have to answer it right now, but if somebody knows what it means, you know, that would be helpful. <laughs> Well, I could only imagine, Bob, that it would be a flag that would be hung off of a building that might say open or closed or something like that. Oh, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Well, that's a pass that's one possibility. Um, but if no one can figure out know what that's supposed to mean, then either you need we need to come to some conclusion at some point of what it should mean. Or if there's no conclusion, then take it out because it's a meaningless word, open flag. Um, and then the second uh, thing I just point out in the construction sign and in the real estate sign, the language says in both cases, uh, permit required unless the sign um, shall not, uh, shall be removed within 45 days. Well, my question was 45 days of what? 45 days of the permit, 45 days of the installation, 45 days of the end of construction. You know, and so I just I just put 45 days of installation, but maybe you want to put something else there. But I thought I'd put something in that seemed to make some sense. Um, because otherwise, it could be up there forever if you don't define it in a certain way. So this is the format, and this can be, and this needs some more tweaking, but not a lot. And I guess again, this is all your existing language um, that I'm proposing to use for the residential section, the business section, just the residential districts, the business districts, and the industrial districts. There may be opportunities for some other parts of your sign law, sign by law. To also create a table, but clearly some of it, like the purpose section, that's not going to have a table. You know, the procedures and things like that will have pretty much the same language you have now. I I don't I haven't gone into it deep enough to figure out if it's all. It might be tweaked somewhat in sequencing, but other than that, I don't see a lot of big changes otherwise. Um, so that's. That's where we are at the moment related to reorganization. Bob, quick question. Are you using the new um, recodified bylaws or are you using the old ones? Because section 311.41, for example, is not has nothing to do with signs. Oh, I must have had the wrong. Huh, that's interesting. I have a printout. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I guess I don't have an updated. Yeah. So the signs are all under 7.2. Um, I don't have an updated bylaw. Well, at least this is the one in front of me is not updated. So thank, uh, thanks for picking that up. I apologize about that. So, so you go. So you're going to go and do business and and everything else in in this same format. I love the format, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And is this the type of format that we would present the town meeting when we're all done? Do you think or yes? Yeah. Okay. As I said, this is uh, more and more towns are doing exactly what you're doing or have been doing it because they're trying to take the text of the bylaw, a signed bylaw, and put it into a table. And as I said, you know, predominantly the tables look similar just because you're dealing with the same kind of information. Yeah. And that's what would end up in the bylaw. Yeah, that'd be terrific. Good question, Bob. Yep. Good. In terms of um, in terms of consolidating the information as much as possible, uh, even when I had tried to create a starting point, you know, I had gone into it and organized the data by district first to get things covered. But I'm wondering, and I I wasn't sure if you looked at the different types of signs. Meaning, if you had what's a certain number of signs? Like if you had fifteen or less sign types. Could you create a table that doesn't have to be broken down each section by district, but rather columns by district, kind of like our table of uses? So your sign type would be like your use, and then you'd have your columns by district saying, okay, well, here's your max height for that district, and is it maybe it's prohibited in that district, is it permissible, et cetera? 
just because I feel like while I like the tabular uh, view in terms of overall information, you're pro you're you're not we're not really cutting down a lot of pages of information. You still have to flip through a lot of sections. I was wondering if you had, had evaluated whether or not the data could be consolidated even more based on the sign type, or maybe we have to look at that later. Um, I haven't, Eric, but uh, I mean certainly something I could. The, the question is, uh, are your sign types, um, so how many sign types do you have? And are yeah, they, not the counting. And how, how consistent are they? So mm -hmm. if you have a certain type of sign, because you have this language that says, well, in the uh, these are the signs allowed in the residential districts, and they're also allowed in the business and commercial districts. But then you have signs in the business and commercial districts separately that are different. So exactly, you may and it's need to re um, rename certain signs so you're using consistent text, consistent Agreed. language, so you don't end up with thirty signs, but twelve of them are the same sign but called something different. You know, something like that. Exactly. Um, I think there's a potential opportunity there where we could probably have. 12 different sign types and cover everything that our existing bylaw currently defines um, and maybe make it even clearer to people um, or yeah. provide an opportunity to the zoning review committee to say, all right, well, are these the signs you want to define or here's a couple of definitions that we've consolidated, th that type of thing. So, so as Bob mentioned, he sent this over today. I haven't had a chance to, to review it. Without... You know, again, off the top, this is off the top of my head. One thing is you add another column here. So you have sign type down the first column on the left. And then on the right, and the next column may says, you know, district allowed. And then the standard is the height and everything on the, the remaining of the columns. So you can, that's one way to combine it. There may be uh, other ways of combining it as well. Um, but we'll really have to look at, um, the business and industrial district in depth and compare all through or compare all your districts as to how they're structured and what they said. Yep. Yeah. It's it looks easy until you start digging into it and it's a lot. Yeah. Of, it's a lot and the of other the other issue I just I'll just put out there um is I was trying to keep this table from uh, I was trying to keep this table on a portrait format, because your whole bylaw is on a portrait thing, format. And sometimes you'll see a sign bylaw grow and grow and grow horizontally, and then it becomes an 11 by, you know, 8 by 11 or 11 by 14 piece of paper that makes it hard to put it on your website with the rest of the, and then for anybody that wants to print it out, it's, uh, you know, just is kind of discombobulated a little bit. Yeah, format and orientation are definitely important. Um, so uh, I, I always think that's important, but I just throw it out to you in case you want to try some other format. But I mean, Personally, I'm not opposed to turning my zoning bylaw sideways as long as it fits on an eight and a half by 11 by landscape. If it's really, if there's a huge benefit to uh, consolidating information that way, but I agree that we can try, we should try to avoid it first. I agree too. What are the challenges that you're running into, Bob, as you're looking at this? Well, um, again, the it just, you know, there's probably going to be more language cleanup or, you know, trying to make things consistent. And uh, and I I don't know, maybe there's some more words in here that nobody knows what they mean. I don't know. Uh, so, you know, that, that'll have to be cleaned up. Um, the other issue that uh, was the third, so we had the format. The second issue is the business district signs. And so, you know, how, how do we want to include changing business district signs in this um, go round of the sign bylaw rewrite? Or is that a second phase? And I, I, I don't, you know, it, it just, that, that's a question that's out there. I mean, so that's I, from a staff perspective. And, and I guess, you know, we have Joe from the, um, in the ZBA, who's often involved with sign applications. I know that the 
the uh, building commissioner, myself, once we have the information listed in tabular format, I, I, I would prefer to have something submitted to the submitted to town meeting when we when the zoning review committees had an opportunity to evaluate the content as well. Um, because the work that goes into organizing it isn't going to be lost um, just because you've gone through the process of evaluating some of the content. Once you get it proposed to town meeting, you can highlight the things that might have been changed or have them review the whole the whole bylaw. Um, I, th I think it would be it be it would be potentially an opportunity lost to have to go back twice one for the reorg the reorg and another for the the content but that's kind of what you did with the rest of the bylaw the whole as it, in its entirety I understand I was just hoping that once it was tabularized it would be more convenient for the zoning review committee to identify areas that were problematic. If your question, Bob, is, is do we want to do this in two phases? I think the answer is is no. We would rather do it once. Because we already had we already did a little bit of sign bylaw changing a couple of town meetings ago. And I don't want to keep having sign changes every other town meeting. So if we could do it once, do it thoroughly and be done with it, I think that would be our preference, mine anyway. And it's just right. give you a little background. The the business end of it is usually the heavy hitter. That's the most number of cases that we that we get. Yep. Okay, yeah. So uh, <laughs> larger signs, Joe. I'm sorry. Are they coming to Are they coming to you to get larger signs? Uh, additional signs, larger signs, additional signs, signs okay. in various locations. Yeah. Okay. And we have well, we have one business in town that. Rather than put up a sign on the side of the building, they just did a wallpaper with their name all over it, sideways, upside down, to try and skirt the bylaw, which I don't think is right, but that's just me. So I don't I don't think they were trying to skirt the bylaw. It was I think it was a yeah, I'll save my opinion to myself. Well, they certainly managed to get their point across many times. <laughs> Is the biggest issue with the the sign bylaw the formatting and making it easier to understand, or is it the content? Well, I, I think there's a couple of answers to that, if I might. Sure, go right ahead. So the um, you know the times I've read the sign bylaw, uh, for the most part, I think the language is okay. But the big issue, um, uh, I think the formatting will help the tabula, you know, putting things in tables will help quite a bit because just people find these easier to read than reading through paragraphs and, you know, we, you know what we did in the, in the regular bio. But the bigger substantive issue is the third issue I raised, which is the constitutional issue. So this is um, this is an enormous gray area. I'll put it that way. Uh, going back to the um, uh, Supreme Court decision, while it was, I believe, a five to four vote that came down on uh, much more strict interpretation about what's constitutional and what's not constitutional, there were actually eight separate decisions from nine justices uh, in that decision. Now, five of them agreed one way and four of them agreed a different way, but they had eight separate reasons for why they did or didn't agree, uh, which is not helpful uh, when um, uh, trying, to, trying to be clear to communities what they can and can't do. Uh, so that part's clear as mud. Yes. And, and it gets a little muddier. Um, so there have been no court cases in the state of Massachusetts based on Reed versus Gilbert, either at the state level or at the district, the United States district level. So there's been no guidance 
locally, if you will. Now, there have been court cases in other states, and um, to continue the muddying, uh, you know, one court says, I think under Reed or, you know, under the Reed case, you can do X. And then courts in Tennessee or wherever. And then a court out in, you know, Washington State says, oh, no, under Reed and, uh, you know, Reed versus Gilbert, you can't do X. You can do Y, but you can't do X. So the, the courts that are starting to get cases like this are not in agreement. So that just muddies it some more. So based in part on all the muddiness, the attorney general has taken the following tack, if you will, when uh, towns submit bio, uh, signed bylaws, recodified signed bylaws, or even bylaws that were rewritten to quote unquote adhere to the Reed case, which if you read those bylaws, they're all they're all different. <laughs> a lot of them are different. <laughs> so that just muddies it even more. But the attorney general has a standard letter now that she sends to towns that send adopted bylaws, signed bylaws, to for their review. And it basically says, um, Related to your sign, you know, Amendment 12 or whatever for your sign by the law, please be advised of the following. And then gives a very long description of the Reed versus Gilbert case and what the courts said. Without the AG weighing on one way or another, just kind of repeating and giving an overview of the Reed versus. And then sometimes we'll say, some of the uh, language in your signed by law might not be in accordance with the Reed decision, but because the attorney general has nothing to base a, um, a denial on, because there's been no court decisions in this state, he will say um, the town should work with the town attorney and get the town attorney's opinion about what's in your bylaw in terms of, you know, what's okay and what's not okay. Now, you should do that anyway, but because it's so muddy, I think one of the results of that is attorney X in town X says this, and attorney Y in town Y says something different. So it's just part of the muddy of all of this. Um, and uh, a couple of times I've seen the attorney general say, uh, okay, you know, you should talk to your attorney, your town attorney about this, but section whatever, 3.5.6.B, that is clearly oh. in violation of the Reed case, and I disapprove of that section. Um, but otherwise, you do your best, and you... Um, now, some towns have just taken the tack. We're not going to, um, uh, we're going to be as uh, clear as we can to be in accordance with Reed. The basic, the basic decision of Reed, if you will, is for what's called non-commercial speech. And particularly, you find that in the residential district here. Um, you know, your, the homeowner's name, the street address. Um, uh, what else do you have here? Uh, off a directional sign, um, uh, sign permitting to a non residential use, subdivision names, ball field signs, home occupation signs, flags. Um, the um, sign regulations cannot talk about the content of signs. If the building commission has to read the sign to know what category it falls into, that's a content-based sign. So what some communities and more and more have done, try to just clear out, instead of having all these categories like you have, which most towns have, they say, okay, in a residential district, you can have, you know, I'm just throwing numbers out here, you can have one sign of two square feet on the residential house, where you could put your name or your street address without, and you can have another sign that's 
<clears throat> whatever, four square feet, six square feet, you know, three feet high, whatever, you know, 10 feet away from the property line, period. And then it's up to the homeowner. What could they put on? They could put uh, their home occupation. They could put, you know, happy birthday, grandpa. They could put a political message. They could put anything. So the courts have said time, place, and manner is perfectly constitutional. Where the sign is, how many signs, the size of the sign, but not what's on the content of the sign. So towns that want to not get into a constitutional issue in court just clear out all these categories and say, okay, this is the size of the sign, this is how many signs, this is where you can put them, and leave it at that. So that's one end of the spectrum, if you will, in terms of sign readings. That greatly reduces the size of your sign by um, And then the building commissioner is not trying to figure out if something is content-based or not content-based or making a judgment call on this sign versus that sign. Um, so that's the substantive issue, Eric. That's really the meat of the sign by law and trying to figure all of that out is what is going to take discussion in time. Yeah, that's the big one. But I guess maybe it's a question for Joe. Um, where do people that come in front of the ZBA, is it is it the content that's unclear or is it the, the formatting? Because, you know, I look at it and say, it would be great if we, you know, to cover both of those, if they're equal, you know, if, if we have problems with both, okay, fix those. If the constitutional one is more of a long drawn out one, then we may say, you know what, fix the, you know, as much as we can on the content side that we have problems with now, because I don't know if we run into any first amendment issues, but get and address that later. Um, so what do we run into now? We don't really run into like, uh, wording of, of like a constitutional issue that I, I can see. Right. Uh, primarily, it's the number of signs, how you calculate, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you calculate how large they are, uh, where they're placed on the building, uh, the placement of uh, auxiliary signs, freestanding signs and whatnot. We've had special cases where uh, a particular business location, it's a, it's a one building that is that could be subdividable, had multiple entities in it so they had multiple licenses for for various products and they came back and they said well we really should have a uh, science for each one of our product lines and we went back and we discussed it and it was very carefully <laughs> excuse me checked and we ended up going through and allowing that as a special variance for that particular customer we have other other people that may have one sign and because of the location of their building they may want to have it a double-sided that's attached to the building. It comes out as a structure, right? Even though they're allowed one sign, they, they can constitute that as one sign, but it's double-sided. So again, some of those nuances, somebody can have a freestanding sign, doesn't mean that they're gonna have one, one you know, wording on one side and it's gonna be blank on the other, right? So I, so I can see that. Yes. Um, but mainly it's the number of signs in their placement and the, and the size. So we will have discrete letters we then have to try to calculate what the surface square area is of the letters and then calculate that and add that all up and see if, if they fall within the, the, the rule of, of maximum square footage, things like that. Joe, can I follow up with a question just on that last one? So if somebody comes in and doesn't have like a framed sign, but puts up, you know, A, B, C, you know, M, O, V, E, R, S, then you're calc trying to calculate around those letters as to no actually uh, if that's a if that's a sign that's rectangular and it's got separate letters on a background we will take that entire rectangle right and calculate that but if they have the letter o the letter g or whatever we then cal try to calculate the square footage and add that all up for the discrete letters that are on the front of the and building. And it's just on the building without, yeah, without yeah. the, yeah, yeah. okay. So yeah. they sort of spread it out. Maybe they can use some larger lettering and they can spread it out. Maybe that comes into a play if the building is a little bit farther away from the street. So they yeah. need a little bit more okay. uh, visual presence. All right, thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Bob, you need from us to try and put this all together or? 
Uh, no, I'll just keep, I'll, I'll work on the, uh, you know, uh, trying to get a format for the whole bylaw reorg and uh, look at some options and then we'll, whatever we've got for your next meeting, we'll get it to you ahead of time. That table for the business science will really be helpful. That'll be good. And I think the recodified uh, uh, bylaws are on our website, right, Eric? They've got to be. Yes, sir. I can get it to you in Word document, Bob. Yeah, that's that. I that would need easier. a Word document version. I mm -hmm. thought I thought I I I obviously had the wrong Word document version because that's where I took it off of. So uh, understandable. All right, so let's move on to the next agenda agenda item. If we're all set for that, right? Which is number three: quick update on zoning amendments for May twenty twenty four. Um, this should go quick, Eric. Is this what Billy wanted to jump in on, or just jinx me? Well, hang on a second. If you'd like to find out what he'd like to comment on at this point, I will click the uh, allow to talk. Go ahead, Billy. Whenever you're ready to unmute. Test, test, test. You're here. We can hear you. All right. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the zoning articles, amendments. I think we'll turn the floor over to you. We've we're pretty familiar with them, so if you've got some. Input by all means, take it away. Well, it's not only just input, Chaz. I mean, also, I have some co questions. You guys are talking on a higher level than I, I can talk on. Okay, okay. Uh, so you, well, let's take them one, one at a time then. So, the MBTA communities, uh, okay, I, I'll start on the easy stuff first, if you don't mind. By all uh, means, 9.1 9 inclusionary zoning. It uh, looks like we, you're suggesting to no longer do the payment of a fee in lieu of town affordable housing into the trust fund. I remember that as being touted as a way to get funds to build affordable units elsewhere. So why, why is that being suggested? Well, mostly because we would rather have the builder do it than have that put on to us to do it. Um, we went through, we had to jump through all kinds of hoops with the Toll Brothers in order to get affordable housing built as part of their project. And we've had other entities that have approached us and say, well, we'll just here, we'll donate some land. And well, what's the value of the land? And we'll, we'll, we'll give you some cash so we don't have to do it. Uh, and then it becomes in the onus of the town to have to accept that responsibility. And we would rather not do that. So that's why we're looking at dumping that part of the provision from that by law. So, so it just hasn't worked out? It, it really hasn't, no. Okay. okay. Uh, the next thing, open space residential development amendment. Uh, a, the planning board may grant a special permit for open space residential development in the R1 district for a single family detached dwelling, dwellings and accessory structure subject to provisions of this section. Then you want to strike town meeting approval, I believe, of, of open space residential plan prior to the granting of a special permit. Well, I'm confused. I don't want to build on any open space. <laughs> so, uh, so can what, you, it, give what me it's an doing of an open space residential development? Can I clarify that briefly, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, please, Eric. Sure. Um, I was actually talking to somebody about this uh, today with regards to the language that's used to commonly identify what open space residential development means. And it doesn't mean residential development on protected open space. Uh, what it means is that it provides an opportunity to developers to modify a definitive subdivision plan so that smaller lots could be used. And then the additional area would be put into a consolidated um, contiguous area that everybody can access versus individual one and a half acre parcels where each individual family can only access an acre and a half of their own open space. Um, so it's just basically an opportunity for a different type of neighborhood development. So this would circumvent the acre and a half requirement. No. What, if, if I could jump in here just for a minute. Sure. It's going to remove the town meeting requirement that the town, that the town approved this because it's, in, it's in conflict with state law. That's what we have to change. Is that we it should not be town meeting approved. We already have an open space residential development file. Right. Okay. Do we have an example of any open space re development in town? 
I think the area like near Sequoia is the one that comes to mind for me, where you have less than one acre lots, and then you have um, open space that the lots uh, are are circulating around. Um, Eric, you have one that you might want to describe. Clover Hill Circle, Emerald okay. and Diamond, they're all that way. Okay, I'm uh, Think of them those. as cluster developments. So for example, Billy, my lot, I live on a one acre lot. It's slightly under one acre, actually. And there is common land that's around the development that is for open space and passive recreation only. So mm -hmm. the builder in that case had, you know, 63 homes. And there was, uh, I think that there was somewhere around 100 acres total. But that way, I don't have to take care of an acre and a half. But there's uh, a buffer zone be between developments. Emerald and, and Diamond is, is a same, same type of thing. Right. It doesn't change the number of homes that can get constructed. It, you have to do a regular subdivision plan to identify how many homes that land could yield given the existing zoning. And that's the number of homes that you can put into an open space residential subdivision application. It just reorganizes it onto smaller lots. It's the same number of dwellings. Okay. At last evening, uh, Mr. Murphy spoke that this was not disallowed in the letter. Isn't that correct? Was not specifically disallowed. I understand you're saying it was, it's not right with state law, but it was not specifically disallowed in that letter. So why can't we get a letter saying it's disallowed? Sure, let me share my screen because uh, we do have that. Um, when I was communicating with the Attorney General's office uh, after our receipt of their review for the recodified zoning bylaw, um, they explained that it was an oversight on their part that they did not reject the um, town meeting requirement for the open space residential development bylaw. I asked if they would edit that letter. They typically don't do that. Um, I said, can you give me some something, some communication from your office explaining why town meeting uh, is recommended to or and or required to remove that portion of the zoning bylaw and we received the letter that's being shared here. Um, the attorney general's office explained that they disapproved the text that required town meeting to approve special permits for multifamily developments because it conflicts with state law. And it's the attorney general office's understanding that similar language appears in the town's open space residential development bylaw, which was not disapproved as part of my review as the of the town's recodification. However, this text in the open space residential development bylaw also conflicts with the same state law for the same reasons that we provided in our disapproval of the town meeting requirement, approval requirement of multifamily development special permits. So essentially what they're saying is if we noticed it, we would have removed it. Okay, just be prepared to have that at town meeting, I'd suggest, okay? Sure, I mean, town, town meeting can, you know, I'll present the same information that I'm presenting here. We'll let the town meeting make a decision on whether or not they want to approve the, the amendment based on the feedback from uh, the attorney general's office. I, Essentially, I, I, what, what happens is when you require town meeting approval for uh, either a subdivision plan, which is regulated through state uh, requirements or special permit or something else, there's no criteria that's been set and you don't know what entity you're going to be presenting to uh, from one town meeting to another. Um, it, it's just not an acceptable legal process to give full discretion to a town meeting for something that is regulated by state law. Well, okay. I hear you, Eric, that we give we give discretion to town meeting to do all kinds of things I disagree with, but so. Right. Those, those are typically things that are statutorily uh, permissible or with the authority yeah, given to yeah. town meeting, yeah. financing approvals, zoning amendments, things yeah. like that. So there's processes and procedures yeah. for town meeting and their responsibilities, and there's processes and procedures right. for other special permit um, authorities as well as specifically for planning boards. Okay, respectfully, I'd like to move on because we're going to get in the weeds. We're not going to agree on a lot of that stuff, but... Uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, got so, really... so, but I understand. Uh, but I understand the issue. I understand the issue uh, clearly, more clearly now. And thanks, Eric gave me an example. Now, MBTA communities, if we can move on to that a little bit. Uh, yeah. 
with those three proposed sub-districts are changed, will their new designation actually instead of R1 or 1-1 or whatever they are, will they become designated as MCOD zoned communities? Um, the answer to that is that the, the sub-districts that are identified, and I, I wanted to clarify as well, because I talked to John Murphy, a resident uh, who was in attendance at the select board meeting last night, uh, who suggested a clarification so that everybody understands that all three sub-districts are, are put together. They are all part of the district that's being proposed for MBTA communities. It's not one out of those three or two out of those three. It's all three together. Yes. They're separated throughout town. So they're all yes. part of the district. Yes. Those are overlay districts. So really all it's doing is allowing for within the boundaries of those sub-districts, multifamily, um, multifamily housing, is, is permissible by right and applicable to the site plan review process. It doesn't change any of the underlying zoning. Okay, so if they're industrial, they stay industrial. If they're resident, residential, they stay residential. But 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 I, I get it. Okay. Okay, so I do understand that. Strictly an overlay. It doesn't change any of the underlying zoning. Okay. And that's in case something else happens with those properties, I guess, eventually. Well, it gives the developer, you know, the owners of those properties, it gives them that flexibility. They don't have to take advantage of the um, MBTA community's overlay district. They can go ahead and develop something else that's non-residential. Yeah. Yeah. But that would, I don't know what that does to us, but um, then under the topic, the dialogue, you said oper of opportunities. There was a comment and because we talked about traffic last evening, and I have some comments about that, because I, I obviously I can't speak up during select board meetings. It, the comment in, in, under opportunities, the dialogue says, th these access points to the highway are likely to alleviate potential congestion of local roadways. Well, in my opinion, that appears to be an embellishment. And here's the reason. MBTA housing requires space for families. Every unit is what I understand. That will equal children riding buses coming and going from that location up and down Middlesex Road. Okay, and many guardians will use their vehicles instead to transport to local schools and daycare. Okay, so there's a lot of traffic going to go up and down that road. And there are two gas stations headed back down south on 3A. There's, not, there's nothing going that other way that's easy to get to. So, you know, that's going to be a, going to be a traffic issues that may, may not have been considered if that's full of children and buses coming and going twice a day. I don't know if that's ever been discussed at all. Next thing, that's my comment. Question. How close is the Feather Lane Mall motorcycle parcel to the nearest cannabis dispensary? Well, our bylaw says 500 feet, and certainly that any of the ones that we have uh, designated is not within 500 feet. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to ask because I, we know that was an issue with with uh, Simons and and that, and 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 so children children can be still only have to be 500 feet away, Chas. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Well, just a question I want to make sure of because we don't want to run into another pickle like that. No, we uh, we took that into consideration, Billy. You, you go out with a tape measure. I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. They had to be on the other one. Okay, I hope they didn't do it on this one. That's all I'm saying. Well, I think if you take a close look at where the, uh, the the zones that we've set aside and where we would allow anything to be built, we would certainly make sure that it was uh, okay. it would comply with the marijuana bylaws. It looks okay on the GPS map, but I'm just asking. Okay. Don't worry, we, we won't miss that one, I promise you. Okay, thank you. I'm bringing it up. Okay. Then, then one wonders, this is a comment, one wonders if the current cannabis store locations would have been chosen had there already been hundreds of families living in that area. Okay. What is the social and developmental effect on children riding the bus daily for a couple of decades past two cannabis locations living next door to a casino? Okay, so I'm saying to you, I suggest that someone reach out to the executive office of Health and Human Services for possible input, input on those issues. Okay, because I see that as a social issue. The potential subdistrict is located, and then 
That's the comment. Then the next thing, the, the, there was a comment said the potential subdistrict is located in close proximity to the Merrimack River, has many potential scenic and recreational amenities for residential use. Can someone describe those? What those might be? Well, I, I think that the three locations we have designated, you cannot see the river from where they are. Um, so I'm not sure what you're pointing. I'm really to. talking about at the mall. That comment was made about the ones at the mall. You can't see the river from the mall. Well, that's the comment made in, in the dialogue. The potential subdistrict is located pro close proximity to the Merrimack River. That's talking about subdivision two. And has many potential scenic and recreational amenities for residential use. That's in the dialogue on the website. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm, so I was asking somebody to describe what those might be. All right, I'll let it go there. You just maybe take a look at that because that's that's. Uh, let me let me think about that one, Billy. I I, I don't know if we're going to put him go make a walkway to the river or something. I don't know. But folks, I think we need to think about because I'm I mean that's definitely an issue. I wouldn't people go into that location at the mall, okay, right there. That that you, they're only going to go there if they have to, okay. Thank you but for listening to me. One of the reasons that we chose that location is because it would be very easy to build there and it's very close to Route 3. I know, but the school bus, I know I heard that last night, but the school buses, I don't no one talked about the school buses coming and going down that road. Okay. Okay. Sure. Mr. Chair, can I briefly talk about the recreational opportunities? I think the line that you're referring to, Billy, is... Um, what criteria was used to identify potential parcels and areas to include in the district? And the recreational opportunities line says proximity to recreational opportunities such as sports fields, trails, fitness centers, and commercial recreation, such as playing fields, Kimball's Farm, or Nashua Valley, Neshoba Valley Ski Area, which was probably okay. a character from another community um, right, in terms right. of some information that was provided by uh, NIMCOG. But generally, you know, this is the type of thing that the zoning review committee used when it was trying to determine the best places for the districts to be located. Yeah, I hear you. But the locations behind behind 440 and Olympic Garden, okay, and a location, the big location at Pheasant Lane Mall, for 18, 20 years of their life, they're going to go buy two cannabis places in the casino, okay? So you can paint it any way you want. And that's my comments. Okay. And Mr. Chair, just to, so the, the one at the Pheasant Lane Mall, that, that's about 500 feet from the Merrimack River. Uh, that's the one on Middlesex. The one on Middlesex is even close. That's, that is on the river. That's yep. a little bit different. But the one at Pheasant Lane, can't see it <laughs> because you get the mall and nobody goes that particular way, but the river goes right there. Yep. I think that's what NIMCOG was, was referring to. The crow flies, you can get there. I hear you, Eric. Okay. I'm sure we could build a walkway down there, you know. But we can't get a walkway along our river, Eric. It'd be nice. The train tracks are in the room. We had the, a walkway the train tracks like the a boulevard. Side. That'd be nice. You may be seeing something near the Sherburn area because we now yeah. have that property that we own. Yeah, I know about that property. That's that that's a sore point with me. I'd rather puke than even talk about that property. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Billy. Um, okay, so a couple of the other things that we haven't discussed with these. Um, the last one would be the rezoning of parcels along Kendall Road. I don't think we're going to have that ready for town meeting unless, Eric, you have some more information that I don't have. Uh, I'm not I'm not entirely sure why. We, we have letters drafted to residents of the neighborhood. Let me just share my screen. This is what is posted to the to the website. Um, residents in lots one through eight requested uh, consideration for rezoning to something other than residential. Uh, would probably make sense to either be B three or an industrial district. The planning board had requested to coordinate input from the community, so the public hearings would provide an opportunity for that. I did my best to try to ensure that three meetings would be available. As I mentioned before, some 
we don't have enough planning board members to conduct our hearings on the 21st. Uh, it gives you two public hearings as well as potential conversation time in between um, to hear neighborhoods input on that. Um, if you decide that you haven't gotten enough input, then the planning board can, could say that they didn't receive enough input or they still need more time and basically vote to not recommend that it goes on the warrant. But I felt like the best opportunity to ensure that you've got community uh, residents coming out to discuss the item is to provide them with a, a public hearing form to have their opinions shared. Okay, well, I I could be mistaken, but it was my understanding they really weren't in any rush to do this and that they thought that if we could look at this for the fall town meeting, that would be fine with them as well. So. Yeah, a little bit of what, what, what Chaz is saying. I, I, I know that this is entertained, but I don't I don't know if we're going to get through it. Uh, there was a lot to digest, at least from from my end of first trying to get the input from the neighbors. And that's why we said I, I know that they've the, the neighbors uh, one through 8A, uh, all those lots have signed on to this, but they wouldn't move forward if the planning board didn't um, basically take the initiative and all agree to bring this forth to town meeting. I, I need a I personally need a little bit of time to digest about what what the impact of it is and hearing from the other neighboring parcels would be helpful because I don't know if I'm I'm in a rush to to move on it. Um, I I do want to understand like how this impacts small lots and industrial zones and are we what is the potential development that can happen here. Um, our, would a, would a, maybe an industrial developer come in and um, take all the properties and then convert it into one one parcel then or some kind of subdivision for industrial zone? Could it feed off of the existing ones that are already there? I guess I, I really want to know what the possibilities could be built first before just saying, yeah, let's let's go ahead and and pass the industrial zone in the in that area. I understand it's a little disjointed over there but uh, I, I at the same time we're getting rid of residential and not we're not adding any residential anywhere so there's a trade-off there as well um should we open this up to a discussion of other properties around town that might have a similar issue i know you don't tackle one thing at a time but i don't know my opinion i just I want to. I want an opportunity to really digest how and and really think it out when we're making this kind of shift here. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, we can. I mean, if if we want to leave it on for more discussion, we can do that. But I, I, I don't see us coming even as a planning board coming to a conclusion on this in time to get it to to this town meeting. All right. Uh, the, 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 the feedback that I got from the planning board during the discussion about what items to include on the public hearing advertisement was that you had enough time to, you know, at the time it was three meetings um, to include this article for community input. And it was enough time for you to potentially evaluate it and decide whether or not it would go on the warrant. It was already included on the original adver legal advertisement. I'm not really sure what implications there are if I change the legal advertisement when we re-advertise it um, for the public hearings to start on the 4th if I remove one of the articles. Just because we advertise it doesn't mean we have to go through with it, though. It absolutely does mean that you have to have a public hearing on that item. Okay, well, we can have a public hearing, but I mean, at this point, they haven't even decided. I know they were looking to us for guidance, but they don't know whether they want to turn it into industrial or business. Right. I like I said, pulled, you right? have the public hearing, but you don't have to be comfortable with putting it on the warrant. But it could get pulled just like every other um, item does on the floor. It could just get pulled at the moment. My point is, it has to go through the planning board for the public hearing process, right? And then you have your public hearing. At the end of the public hearing, the planning board can decide what action it wants to take. If you don't feel comfortable with recommending it to be on the warrant, then don't recommend it for the warrant. Just say, we don't feel comfortable with that. We can reevaluate it as we move forward for a different town meeting. You can re-notice it. No problem. It doesn't have to be pulled from the floor. Uh, 
unless the planning board itself decides that everything made sense in the public hearing and you feel comfortable with recommending to the select board to include it on the line. Okay, then fine. Leave it Leave it the way it is for advertisement purposes. And Just review. Can I just ask one yes. last question about it? Um, so uh, when it comes back, um, when we have a quorum in the planning board, and just a procedural thing, um, as far as um, recommend, how does it work for our end? I understand it's open to the public to comment, and that's great. Like, ha let's start having the discussion on it. Um, but is there at that point um, a vote of recommendation or not? And I'm just curious how the process works for the planning board. Sure. Um, typically, uh, you get a motion for recommending to town meeting, and then you get a vote from the board. But if it if if it if we have had some circumstances where there's a negative motion made, meaning somebody makes a motion says I recommend not, or, or I make a motion to not recommend this to town meeting, and then the group just you know, votes on that. Um, especially if you feel like the general sentiment uh, on the board is that you don't, it's not going to be headed towards town meeting. I think it would probably make sense um, to make that negative motion, let that negative motion pass, and it would never get onto the warrant at that for that town meeting. Well, and Eric, we still have to put it on the warrant. So the Correct. planning board makes a request to put it on the warrant, and then the select board votes to put it on the warrant. And then we we each will vote whether we recommend the article at that point. But, you know, it's one of those, it's a planning board item. So <laughs> we look at it and say, tell us if you want it on the warrant. Um, you know, for, for those types of things, we typically are going to go with the recommendation of the planning board, but we don't we don't necessarily procedurally have to. So these are so these are really just to get this thing in front of the public from the planning board perspective. Then. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, farmers market. Definitely, we want to discuss that and and I think move forward with that one. We've talked about the other three. The only thing that remains is the uh, remove the prohibition of solid waste disposal in the industrial district. Correct. So I gave a, a, a new update to the select board last night based on information um, that I really didn't have until yesterday morning or so with town council. So um, the attorney general's office uh, rejected and removed two items from the recodified zoning bylaw. One was the town meeting requirement for multifamily housing. We've already covered how they had an oversight and probably would have removed the town meeting approval for open space residential development, but didn't. That's why it's an article of here. And the last one was the uh, prohibition of solid waste disposal in the industrial district. And the attorney general's office referenced specific language in mass general law um, that explains why they rejected it. When I spoke to town council, he mentioned that there was another community um, that was going through something similar where they had a recodified zoning bylaw that was it had exactly the same scenario, um, but he pointed out that there's language in, this, in the Mass General Law that says, unless a community had already prohibited this use prior to July 1st of 1987. Um, that's the same case in, I think he said it was in Boxborough. So Boxborough had requested that the Attorney General um, adjust their review letter to reflect that because they provided evidence that the town had um, previously prohibited uh, solid waste disposal in before July 1st, 1987. And they were refusing to uh, modify their letter and suggested that the community re, uh, um, re-approve their prohibition of that use in the district and provide that evidence to the Attorney General's office after a town meeting review. So that's what our town council was recommending for Tingsboro. He will request um, an adjustment from the Attorney General the same way he did for Boxborough, but he said he wasn't confident that they were going to make an adjustment. And he suggested that we move forward with um, the towns either making it by special permit or make or reaffirming its prohibition with that information. Which I'm sure reaffirming its prohibition is not going to be a controversial issue at town meeting. And is that the way you're going to present this to town meeting then? That we're well, when you, when politician. the planning when the planning board has its public hearing on the zoning amendment, I'll give the same explanation, and uh, the planning board can decide 
how they want to adjust the language. I'm assuming that you probably want it adjusted to say pro prohibited. Would town council, I mean, is it possible we just ignore this and don't put it on anything? I don't recommend that because town council's explanation is that once the attorney general's office rejected that language, essentially what it means legally, um, that that use is permitted by right at the, at the, in its current state. So you, the town definitely wants to make the correction. Okay. So we can adjust the language at the public hearing then? Yep. Okay. All right. Any uh, further Mr. discussion? Mr. Chair, which, Mr. Yes. Chair uh, which way are you going to go with that? Adjustment of the language or... Yeah, right. Uh, we want to we want to prohibit it. I believe prohibit it. Okay, so, great. Correct. Oh, which, which, which <laughs> put it back. Which to has oh. meant was uh, an adjustment <laughs> based on what was advertised because when I, when I advertised it, I didn't have the information from the um, town council yet. Okay. Any further discussion on any of the uh, zoning amendments? All right. I guess we're good. The only other uh, item on the agenda is to adjourn. Well, we should set our next meeting first just to make sure that we're all on the same page. We've been using the second Tuesday, and I think that's fine. Uh, where's my calendar here? So the second Tuesday would be the 9th of April, 6 o'clock. That worked for everyone. I still have it on my calendar. So April 9th, that's 6 o'clock. I move to adjourn. I have a second. Oh, Bob, you got second. something? You're, you're muted. Bob, you're muted. <laughs> I will not be able, I just checked my calendar. I will not be able to be at that meeting. Okay. Uh, do you think Judy would be available? Because you've got a lot of work to do on the signs, which we're not looking to do that until the fall anyway. Um, I will check with Judy tomorrow. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you what, and this, uh, whatever I've got done more sure. on the signs bylaw, I'll get a draft to you ahead of time, and at least you'll have it in your hands. Okay, that'd be very helpful. Uh, yeah. you know, if you want to discuss it among yourselves and give me any feedback, that would be great too. But otherwise, see you in May. <laughs> okay. Yeah, are you available May fourteenth, Bob? Uh, May fourteenth. I am. Great. So at the very least, it would, well, it looks like we'd be anticipating from a sign by law perspective, it would be like a working session with the information that Bob provided. And I can share the board, uh, the committee's comments. Okay. Yep. Good. All right. So I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thanks, everybody, for your time. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Next Yep. Bye-bye. Recording is off. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Karen. you, Karen.